Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cannon, for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Zhongliang. Uh, I'm uh, currently a final year PhD student. So today I'm going to introduce you uh, our recent work uh, about like uh, how can we like unraveling the protein language model uh, and see how it makes decisions uh, when we build such models on a specific uh, task or like classification task. So uh, specifically, our lab is interested in uh, kinase related topic. So our model is aimed to predict the kinase specific phosphorylation uh, interactions. So uh, before I dig deep into that, uh, I want to first get a, give you a small introduction of the protein language model itself. So um, like, uh, like during the talk this uh, like morning, you probably have not have already heard a lot about like those kind of language models, like uh, you know, like applied on genome data, like some talks about applied on uh, protein data, but how it rec uh, actually works and what is the benefit of using this new technique comparing to all previous uh, like ways of representing sequence. So previously, if you have a protein uh, you want to analyze, so there are two ways, essentially you can analyze this protein. So first way you can represent by the protein sequence, and then you can collect all those uh, homology of this sequence and you can build a profile based on this uh, sequence and do uh, like final genetic analysis of this protein family. Or if you have a structure of this protein, then you can do similar thing like structure-based al uh, alignment. But with this embeddings, we actually like have a new way to represent and compare proteins. Because right now, you know, like each protein is represented by a matrix of numbers. And then you can directly compare the similarity between different protein families simply by calculating the similarity score, like using uh, like score like cosine similarity uh, to compare them. So like uh, the embedding is a great tool, but how can we actually get this embeddings? So like um, this idea of like, using a representation to represent a sequence data is actually more come from, you know, like the language model area where we uh, train a large language model either by playing the filling the blank uh, task or predict the next token. Each of them has their unique benefit, but in the protein uh, language model area, actually most of the model focus on the first one, filling the mask. I think the major benefit is that uh, this task like actually give you a very uh, nice representation for each tokens because each tokens now has the contextual information of its surrounding tokens. So migrating this idea from the nature language processing, uh, we train the protein language model uh, like using the large like protein database like Uniprot. So after the model is trained, it now has an understanding of what is what what is the semantic meaning meaning of the protein uh, sequence. So what is actually inside such models? So previously, like there are many like ways to build such model, like uh, use like LSTM or RNN. But more recently, people uh, like agree that attention mechanism because it's uh, capacity capacity to modeling absolute length of sequence, it is the best choice when you want to model sequence data. So mostly um, like most recent recent protein language model like uh, ESM or uh, ProTrans use the attention as their uh, building blocks for their language model. So after you train such protein language model, what you will get is that each re residue will be represented by a column and each column is actually a vector. So now you translate the original like uh, tokens like uh, amino acid characters into uh, like vectors. That vectors, you can directly compare their similarities. So, okay, so now we have a very nice representation. How do we really use this representation for our Task because we are interested in like protein sequence classification, protein functional prediction, or something like that. So um, over the last two years, our lab has developed multiple uh, different tools in different directions, like to how to how to really use this pre uh, pre-trained protein language.
in order to sum up, uh, we basically focus on two main aspects. The first one is the predictive models. So where we use the representation derived from the protein language model and then further connected in it with some downstream data set and fine tune that kind of model. And second, uh, we also explore how can we directly uh, use the information that learned from the protein, uh, protein language model and extract that, that information to different downstream tasks like evolutionary inference or uh, something like that. So here uh, I'm focusing on the first uh, domain, like how do we use a protein language model for specific tasks? Uh, and here is the phosphorylation prediction. And uh, what is more interesting uh, thing that I'm gonna show is like what the model actually learned during this process. So a little bit background about the phosphorylation. So phosphorylation is one of the uh, most significant, important uh, post-translational translational modification that happens almost in every cell. So like uh, this is actually um, regulated by the enzyme called kinase. Uh, so each kinase will rec uh, recognize different substrate patterns. So our uh, jobs here is for each different kinase to predict what kind of substrate pattern it will recognize and uh, activate the phosphorylation. So to build this uh, framework, we actually uh, curate the data uh, by different ways comparing to a previous method. So uh, we collect uh, uh, positive data from uh, like a recent published data set. And for the negative data, we actually uh, like try different level of uh, like data curation to make sure that our model is not overrepresenting uh, those kind of like easy uh, case where the substrate has no evidence of phosphorylation and so we make sure those kind of data set are like minimum in our uh, final training data set. So after we collect the data set, uh, our approach is three steps. So we first pre-train the model to understand the protein uh, kinase language. And then we fine tune this uh, model to predict whether given ki uh, kinase sub uh, sequence can phosphorate a substrate sequence. And finally, we would evaluate our model and investigate uh, the model for its explainability. So this is actually the uh, architecture of our model. You can see that it has uh, two branches. So first branch is uh, to do the continuous mass language modeling to make sure that the model understand the kinase uh, language better. And second branch is actually for the classification where the model focus on uh, to predict the kinase substrate pair correctly. So comparing our model with all other recent published model, like our model achieves uh, much better performance in terms of AUCRC score. And uh, our model also has very uh, low uh, false positive ratio, it means that uh, because the unique way, uh, like our curation of the negative data, we make sure that the model is not over uh, predicting on the negative data. So after we show that, okay, our model is great. So we want to further know that what the model actually learned during this training phase. So previously, uh, when you want to know such information, uh, the most obvious way you want to do is probably uh, draw a UMAP and like project things into two dimension and see how things clustered. But what UMAP can actually tell you, like if you just use the final model, is the only like uh, what the model finally uh, learned during the process, but you cannot actually learn, uh, know that how the model gradually uh, come into such uh, results or predictions. So in our um, task, we actually uh, first evaluate how the model learned uh, during the training phase by uh, save the different checkpoint and different steps and uh, do the UMAP uh, across the time to see how the uh, clustering actually changed. So very interesting, you can see that because our uh, target substrate uh, has like two di very distinct um, amino acids in the center. So at first, the model just learned to classify different uh, kind of substrate pair based on uh, the center amino acid. Uh, but after the model is trained, it's gradually learned to first merge those two group together and then regroup them by the kinase substrate uh, specificity. And if you look at the uh, BNC panel, you can see that in the final projection that we got, the model kind of learned a mixture of kinase evolutionary information 
as well as kind of uh, finding specificity information, which is really interesting because um, before like this visualization, like you actually don't know like how the model like gradually learn this information. And you without this kind of information, you don't know like where you need to stop training the model. So this is like from a global view, like how the model understand the uh, data before and after it trained. So another uh, perspective that would be very important uh, to like understand is how the model understand like each pair of the data. So that's why we are also um, like examining how the model uh, value different residue uh, when it make predictions. And toward that goal, we actually um, brought idea from uh, Sharp. So that uh, Sharp, uh, if you don't know, is uh, like uh, like permutation based uh, explainable, explainable tool. So it basically it make permutation to the uh, input so that it will give you different prediction score after the permutation happens. So uh, then you can kind of uh, rank like which permutation uh, kind of change your prediction the most to make sure that uh, to determine which residue is more important. So look at this uh, like kind of residue importance score actually help you uh, highlight like for each kind of substrate pair, which region in the substrate is most uh, significant for this decision and which part of the kinase is most relevant to this, uh, this like specific predictions. Yeah, so that is like kind of uh, our like kind of a way of unraveling the black box of the protein language model. Like protein language model is a like very new topic. And uh, I believe like there are many other ways to explain what's happening behind the scene. And with that is of my short talk. Thank you all. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Hey, Zhang Liang, great talk. Uh, I was just wondering, um, have you explored any other models uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the different like natural language processing models, like uh, ProTrans or other models like that? Yes, that's a, that is a great question. Yeah, because right now they are actually bunch of uh, pre-trained language model there, like even for protein or genome, uh, genomic data. So uh, it's like actually uh, interesting like to know which one of them are more uh, are better than others. So in uh, our uh, previous work, we actually uh, examined like uh, how different model performs uh, in the classification task. Uh, and what we find that uh, the ESM family usually have a better performance and uh, another interesting that we find is that uh, the model's uh, size kind of matters at first, but after certain like uh, size, like for example, after five billion parameter, if you further increase the model's uh, parameter without like using more data, it's kind of century. So uh, eventually we decide to use a middle size uh, ESM model as our backbone. Thank you. Hi, uh, nice talk. Uh, I'm curious about the SHAP. So there's a lot of choices in explaining um, or feature attribution. There's like SHAP, there's like CCAM, there's integrated gradients, there's counterfactuals. I was curious, you know, what what went into the decision to use SHAP? What are the trade-offs with SHAP that you think about uh, that might affect, you know, other domains or other, uh, other uh, applications of these protein language models? Thank you. Uh, so yeah, that is another uh, good question. So because like um, actually, you know, like um, the SHAP originally was built actually based on feature, like more feature based uh, predictor. Uh, but like in this area, like uh, when you have like sequence as input, uh, it's kind of hard to really like select which tool is the best. So we actually made some modification to the SHARP because the original shop does not support, you know, uh, tokens like uh, as input. So our um, approach there was to actually like uh, for each token, we like, uh, if we want to change it, we change it to a mask so that it 
like kind of minimize this uh, position's impact to the overall prediction. And another thing that uh, kind of uh, make, make, make us want to use the shaft is also because like in many experimental uh, technique, you will like do mutations to single position so that like we want to kind of mimic that process by, you know, change each position and see how that each position uh, make like impact the overall predictions. And the best, uh, the good thing about Sharp is that it can take not only that uh, per position, uh, like important, it can combine it with all other positions. So it kind of give you like second order interactions. That's why we uh, choose Sharp. Right. Uh, for the no more questions, let's move on to the next talk. Uh, thank you, Zhongli. Um, the next talk is by Dr. Shan Yang. Uh, Dr. Yang is a director of business development at Stomics and Complete Genomics. Um, she's uh, served on multiple uh, sequencing companies in leadership roles and uh, Today, she's here to tell us about some of the informatics tools and workflows she's developing for single cell data analysis. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. I'm sorry, I put this on too early. I guess I'm a little too nervous about this <laughs> technical issues. Uh, yeah. Um, so, today I'm going to talk to you about a, a tool, a uh, bioinformatics tool that enables accurate single cell segmentation for spatial transcriptomics uh, database. So, um, so, um, yeah, and my special thanks to Dr. Hu this morning. He gave a very good intro introduction to the spatial transcriptomics technologies and methods and even um, talk about the, their experience combining the image of data with Visium data. So I'm going to compare and contrast a little bit in my talk. So I changed my slides a little bit. So I think a lot of you guys already know what, what's the difference between you know the bulk RNA sequencing, single cell, and spatial, right? So it's it's kind of an evolution of how we see uh, transcriptome data from uh, from the cell. So from sort of an average smooshed up, average bulk RNA sequencing, we get to the single sequencing where you can see transcription profile from each single cell but you don't know their physical location uh, in the tissue. So once you have the spatial information, you can map back to the cluster. So this, this cluster in the middle, um, it's just the, the you map from, but based on their transcriptome profile right now, with the information, spatial information, you can map that back to your tissue to know where each cluster are, who is next to each, who is next to what, what is their communication in the microenvironment? So that's very cool information. And uh, although it, it is uh, the method of nature of method of year of 2020, it's actually the spatial technology has been developed for a long, long time since early 1980. It's a lot of uh, technologies and, and different approaches. And uh, as Dr. Hu mentioned this morning, if you look at the end data, what you get from the experiment is basically two different types. One is the image data, one is the sequencing data. Um, so I'm going to talk about the sequencing-based analysis. So in the end, you're not getting an image, you're getting a sequence data usually from NGS technologies. So this morning, uh, Dr. Hu look, uh, talked about the Visium data they have with um, their experience with Visium data and their, their approach to combine um, image data with the Visium data to get very nice results and do their research. Um, according to him, uh, the Visium data, the problem of general based sequencing based technology is it's not as high resolution as um, image based data. Uh, but that that's kind of depending on what kind of technology you're talking about. The Visium, uh, the current technology, the current product, the, the spot size, which is the, the location with unique XY coordinates um, is 55 microns. So if you think about in a, in a cell context, a cell is about, about 10 microns in diameter. So as, as Dr. Fu mentioned, uh, 55 is really not a single cell resolution, right? You, you can pack as much as say 20-ish cells. 
in that. And also there's um, the center to center distance is 100 basic means there's a lot of empty space on the chip, so you're missing a lot of information. Um, Seeker, which from a curio, uh, their spot size is about 10 micron, so it's about the single cell size. Uh, and they pack all of the, their beads together, tightly pack them together. So there are barely any sort of empty spot on the chip. So that's improvement. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, mention a little bit about this, this sort of approach later. And versus uh, stereo-seek technology, the spot size is 0.22 micron and, and center to center distance is a half a micron. So if again, if you think about as a cell contacts, a 10 by 10 would have a 20 by 20 matrix um, spots on the each cell that's 400 spots so you can see on the bottom this uh, picture is a nuclear uh, uh, from one of our, our publications this this white cloud and, and all the this little maybe a little bit hard to see this little dot are each spot so you can see indeed there are a few hundred uh, spots underneath one cell so for for visium um, as Dr. Hu mentioned, uh, because it's not single cell resolution, you need to do deconvolution, right? Have a lot of uh, smart ways to do that. Versus for, for stereo-seq, the problem is because there are multiple um, spots on the one cell, you need to do cell segmentation. So from if you get a transcript from this spot, which cell does this belong to, right? So, you know, I, I'm biased. <laughs> I, I think the cell segmentation is a, is a better problem to solve in this case, because you, you, it's really give you a high resolution of data and uh, all you need to do is assign the cells. So um, here we also use similar approach as Dr. Hu, which means basically combine a image data with the, the uh, sequencing data. So the image that we have here is a nuclear staining. So you will have a nuclear staining uh, showing in uh, the white spot in the in the picture. And then the transcripts from the NGS technology you will see as as a as a green one. So basically you have these two types of data. You need to combine them and what you want is a nuclear boundary, right? To tell you where the nuclear boundary uh, cell boundary is um, and, and assign properly which uh, transcript from which cell. Um, another challenge of this is that as we go bigger and bigger in cells, uh, in chip size, which the smallest is one centimeter by one centimeter chip is our most popular size. And as you go uh, to almost seven by seven, you really care about the, the computational speed. If the speed is too low, uh, it's really not going to work. So keep that in mind. These are the two things that we we have to deal with when you do cell segmentation. So can we do this segmentation without image data? Um, it's in some cases, yes. For example, if the cells are really sparse, you basically can look at the transcription uh, data and, and pretty easily define which one, which transcript you belong to what cell. But if, if it's a very cell dense region, like the one on the right side, uh, only looking at the transcript data is not gonna be enough for you to do cell segmentation. So another way is uh, people always want to do direct cell staining of, of their memory, right? Direct is always better. Then you really get the cell memory and you really get no, to know where exactly cells are. And uh, that, that would be nice, but, but in reality, it's, it's pretty hard to get a good antibody to stain me membrane uh, for all cells, especially, uh, the reason usually people start with single cell and, and spatial is that they have a heterogeneous tissue, right? A, a lot of different cell types. It's really hard to find a good antibody set that can stain all the membrane at the same time or at good uh, quality. So what what we have, as I mentioned earlier, is a, is a deputy staining of the cell nucleus. And, and we try to find a way to do cell segmentation accurately with, with this data, this information only. So here I'm going to talk about two things. Um, one, two main steps there. Of course, there's a lot, a lot of steps in, in this, but the two main th steps is, is one is the how to do image tiling stitching. Um, and the other one is how you assign to different cells, cell segmentation. So let's dig into the first one. So my, when you take a mi microscope picture of your tissue, which in our technology, it, you take the same, you take the, picture on the same slice of tissue 
that you are do capturing later. So there is no offset. It's it's completely the same tissue. Um, when you do that, um, the the microscope manufacturer will give you a stitching algorithm. Uh, but as the resolution goes higher and higher to a single cell level, uh, it's usually it's not good enough. So once you get to the single cell level, you need to have a complete workflow that's very accurate, can very accurately um, stitching the, the image together. So this is what we uh, develop. It's an image stitching method, which is called MFWS. I don't know, this, this is not very good naming, but basically uh, it look at the it, nearby tiles and separate them into smaller pieces, right? You have two arrays of, of image on top and on bottom where they overlap. And then you do a FFT, the fast Fourier transform, and then for each row, and then uh, you do a weighted stitching algorithm. So this weighted based on the information that has different tiles and, and the quality of different tiles. And then you optimize that and you stitching the, the, the image together. So, so how does it work, uh, the performance wise? So you can see the left side is uh, the default image stitching from the microscope. And you can see if you have two different color to um, for the same uh, area, you will see the short sort of shadow, right? That's offset by uh, the arrows in the stitch stitching. And also in our chip, we also have a what we call the track line that we use for um, for this uh, ground truth, right? It's a little hard to see, but you can see there's a little bit off. Uh, this is about three microns off uh, from each other. So it's it's not good enough when you're talking about something less than 10 microns. So uh, the left, the middle one is again, the, the microscope default one. And then if you use MFWC, you can see there's almost no um, no sh shadowing. And also the, the uh, track line aligns perfectly with each other. So that does improve the image quality stitching by quite a bit. And and how, how do we compare with other existing uh, methods? We compare that with Mr. Ashla and uh, we can see the MFWS method is has smaller relative arrows as well as a tighter uh, distribution of the arrows. Uh, if, you ask, if you measure the maximum accumulation of arrows, uh, it's also uh, has better performance than, than these two existing methods. And again, another thing, as I mentioned earlier, it's very important to have this uh, very efficient algorithm so that it can perform fast. So as as your chip size goes um, up and it will, will keep a relatively stable speed. So this is really the, the performance on running time. So that's a side, that's one side of things that we really need to take care of the business first to, to have very, very accurate microscope image. The, the second step is really how to assign transcript to each cell, right? And uh, we have this as two-phase approach. The first approach, obviously, you have the nuclei staining, you know where each cell, nuclei of each cells are, so you know where cells are. And if you use that mask, you're basically just covering where the nucleus is. And you are missing a lot of information that outside of the, the nucleus, that that's that kind of transcript will get missed. And uh, the second step was, which you use a sterile cell mask uh, is a phase two. And then you can see compared to the left, the the area of the cell expand uh, to, to certain areas. So you capture basically the transcript of the whole cell instead of just the nuclear location. So what it does is really uh, combine these two set of data. One is, uh, is the image data with the nuclear location. You, you have an anchor where the cells are, right? And then uh, for the transcrip transcription data, you look at their distribution, their, their um, distribution of the transcript. Uh, remember for each cell, we have about 400 data points. So you can have a distribution of the transcripts and use that and uh, uh, combine these two. Uh, the, the transcript is based on this Gaussian mixture model. And then you combine these two and find the optimal uh, segmentation of different cells. You can see these uh, GMM have three peaks uh, representing three neighboring cells. So this generate high accurate single cell gene expression profiles than just using the nuclear 
mask. Uh, if we so you know what, what really important is how you you can use this uh, to improve your biological research, right? So if you look at a nuclear mask versus a steel cell mask, you can see um, it's a better overall clustering with high confidence co coefficient on the right, and also it's sorry a little bit hard to see, but there's a, a better the fewer scatter points uh, within uh, within this sort of noise. So it will get a better signal to noise ratio. You can see it's much, much cleaner in, in this approach where we're using our uh, MLCG molecule labeling approach. And uh, this is a real data set that we look at the brain, mouse brain. And in, if you use the nuclear, un, nuclear only mask, you can identify two clusters granule cell zero and three. And uh, for when you use this better uh, cell segmentation tool, you can identify three clusters, cell clusters. So this, this really improves the rare cell type um, clustering. And you, if you look at the marker genes of this cluster on the right, th these are the three example marker gene. You can see clearly the expression, sort of this yellowish expression uh, uh, on these tissues and exactly at the location where, where it's supposed to be. And uh, it also, uh, this labeling also correlate better with known, known single cell data. So, you know, a, a lot of time when people do spatial transcriptomics, they will combine with single cell because any current spatial technology cannot capture as many transcripts per cell as a single cell experiment. The best way is to combine these two and uh, using this new um, cell segmentation tool, it will get better uh, across the region, across different region and, and tissue uh, anatomic regions, they have better correlation with single cell data. And uh, remember earlier, I mentioned that if you have the cell, like what Curie is having, it's a, their bead is 10 by 10, right? So it's almost a single size, a single cell size, which is represented in the right side is this, this red grid that is 10 by 10 versus the, uh, what the sterile cell uh, cut out the, the cell regions is, is in green. You can see uh, if you have a 10 by 10, although the size is about single size, single cell size, it's kind of artificial grid. So some of, sometimes you get partial cell uh, transcript in, in one grid, and sometimes you get multiple. Of course, usually you don't get more than two, but still, it's a mixture of two cells. And uh, if you use bin 20, which in our, in our sense, the bin 20 is a 10 by 10, because our, our bins are half, half micron. So if you compare the bin 20 and st sterile cell uh, technology, and for the same data set, you can see on the top, the bin 20 and the middle is, is the sterile cell. You can see a lot detailed structure, uh, the cell mixture of each other, and uh, more details in the uh, microenvironment, and you can have more research on how they talk to each other and things like that. Um, again, of course, we also want to compare to existing uh, references like Alan Mouse Alice Bring Alice, and and it does also have more uh, very high consistent with existing references. Um, if you look at marker gene patterns, it's much clearer uh, if you use this method versus using a Bing Twenty method, which Sort of it's a, another small average over a bunch of things versus this one is really looking at the single cell, uh, only look at that single cell, their expression, their profile. So it's not surprising that the, the uh, marker pattern is much clearer. Um, in summary, uh, we the sterile cell provide a complete workflow that include a lot of steps. And today I'm, I only talk in detail about this high, high confidence, high, precision stitching method, as well as the accurate high single cell expression profile for spatial omics data. Um, yeah, and, and I talk about performance compared to different approaches and, uh, and different uh, uh, you know, technologies. Uh, what's next? Of course, we're always excited about what's next. And again, al along the line of this combined uh, the image data versus transcriptome data, there's a lot of things we can do based on this, this framework, we can combine that with uh, multiple uh, immunofluorescence, maybe membrane, maybe something else. 
uh, or plant cell walls. Um, that's a, actually an advantage of if you're doing a plant because you, you actually have a real cell wall and that's equivalent to uh, the cell membrane staining, but better. And then HND, as a lot of pathologists are very familiar with and, and what Dr. Hu talked about earlier, uh, that's also something we can do. And in, and also image free, maybe maybe you can someday can get a very, very good algorithm that we don't really need, need any image, just looking at the transcripts maybe. My guess is for that one, it's probably limited to some specific tissues, specific application, but that's also something we're, we're working on. All right, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. I was just gonna say I'm super clear, but. <laughs> sort of a weird question. Um, so I've seen spatial omics being done a lot in tissues and things. I'm just curious, if it's ever been done to take like a sediment slice or like a marine snow aggregate and try and visualize cells like in a natural sample and see you know if we can replicate observe some of these patterns that we know happen where we have very specific spatial organization and um, you know marine snow aggregates and things. Yeah, right now for the fresh frozen samples, you can you can fresh froze it and, and freeze it and then put it into an OT, OCT or, or something and then we can cut it. I don't know, it's really the question is really your ma material can it keep the shape and relatively uh, position of each other. If you can, um, we can definitely do that. But if it's some for some reason when we cut it or, or something it lose their, their uh, morphology, then it's difficult. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question. So um, do you want to comment on how we can begin to use single cells, you know, sequencing data to so eliminate some of the understudied aspects of the of the genome, right? Because you know, with the expression um, at a single cell resolution, mm -hmm. uh, we can like you're showing, you know, the annotation of, of specific genes. There are a lot of genes that we don't know the functions right. of. So, so yeah. how can we begin to you know sort of better annotate or uh, eliminate the functions of these at the single cell resolution? Yeah. So so at the beginning. I mentioned that if you separate as the end result, right, you can say this is image based or sequencing based. But if you look from the approach of the uh, the design, experiment design, it can you can separate into a target based versus a, a unbiased based. So depending on if you really don't know anything about this, uh, you should pick a unbiased approach, which SteroSeq is because we we capturing the poly A. Tail. So theoretically, any transcript can be captured, and then um, if there's something new, you can you know design your target approach later, right? So this is a perfect tool for exploratory methods. But versus um, if you really know what you're looking for and really want to know a lot of information about a few genes or, or a few hundred genes, maybe uh, a target approach will be better. Okay, uh, there are no more questions. I think we're ready for a break. Uh, we've got a half an hour break and uh, we'll reconvene at 3.15 for the last uh, keynote talk uh, by Andrew White. So I'll let's get started.